Hi, it's Miss Vital. This podcast is on Chapter 54 in your AP Biology book, Community Ecology. A community is a group of populations of different species living in an area. All of the different living organisms in an area are part of the community, and the community does not include any non-living or abiotic factors. These different organisms have interspecific interactions. This is when different species in a community interact with each other. Interspecific competition can also occur amongst individuals in different species when they compete for a resource. Competitive exclusion is if one species has an advantage, it could potentially eliminate the other species. A niche refers to the resources used by a species. Two species cannot coexist in the same niche. So their competition may result in something called resource partitioning. This will differentiate their niches. Character displacement is if two similar closely related species live close to each other and their niches overlap, this is syntactic, character displacement may cause them to develop less similar characteristics. Predation is when predators kill and eat their prey. Adaptations in the predators and the prey have evolved to advance these relationships. Cryptic coloration is camouflage. Mechanical defenses would be things like quills on a porcupine or other structures that an animal uses to defend itself. Chemical defenses can include things like skunk spray and poison frogs or venom from a snake. Aposmatic coloration is when there are bright warning colors. Batesian mimicry is when one species that is harmless mimics another species that is harmful. Malarian mimicry is when two or more harmful species resemble each other. Herbivory refers to organisms that eat plants or algae. They have a lot of adaptations for this type of lifestyle, including symbiotic organisms that live in their gut and help them to break down the cellulose. Symbiosis is when two or more species live in close proximity. Parasitism is when the parasite gets nourishment from the host. The parasite benefits, the host is harmed. There are ectoparasites which live on the outside of an animal or endoparasites which live on the inside of an animal. Mutualism is when both species that live together in this relationship benefit. Obligate mutualism is when one species can't survive without the other. For example, we need E. coli in our gut in order to survive. Facultative mutualism is when both can survive alone, but they still benefit from each other. The acacia plant has a relationship with ants. The ants defends the acacia plant by stinging anything that tries to eat it. Commensalism is when one species benefits and the other is not affected. Pilot fish swim with sharks. When the sharks eat something, the scraps that move around in the water are scooped up by the pilot fish. The pilot fish benefit from this relationship, but the shark or sharks are not affected. Facilitation is when one species benefits another species without living in direct contact with each other. For example, in salt marshes, there's one type of rush plant that prevents salt buildup. That makes it more hospitable hospitable for other plants to live there. The more diverse a community is, the more healthy and stable the community is. Species richness is the number of different species in a community. Relative abundance refers to the proportion each species represents of all the individuals in the community. The more evenly distributed the species, the better. Shannon Diversity, which uses the symbol capital H, compares the diversity of communities. For example, if you took a sampling from a community of an organism, what would the chances be that it would actually show up? So it really compares the relative abundance of each species. The higher H, the H value is, the more diverse the ecosystem. Invasive species are organisms introduced to an ecosystem that don't belong there. They're outside of their native range, 
and more diverse communities are more resistant to invasive species, less diverse communities are more susceptible to invas invasive species. As we've already discussed, food chains show the transfer of food energy up the trophic levels from primary producer to herbivores, which are primary consumers, to carnivores, which are secondary and then tertiary consumers, and then back to decomposers. Food webs link a bunch of food chains. Energy is transferred through the trophic level levels, and it can be, uh, it oftentimes can be lim limited, which is what the energetic hypothesis states, that the length of a food chain is limited by the inefficiency of the energy transfer. Only about 10% of the energy is transferred from trophic level to trophic level. For example, if we start out with 1,000 kilograms of biomass, only 10 kilograms of biomass are transferred to the next level. I'm sorry, only 100 kilograms of biomass are transferred to the next level. And then only 10 to the next. And finally, the tertiary consumers at the top only get one kilogram. Therefore, the numbers are respectively decreased as we move up the energy pyramid. When we talk about biomass, we're talking about the total mass of all the individuals in a population. There's another hypothesis that is related to all of this, the dynamic stability hypothesis. And this basically states that longer food chains are less stable than shorter ones. Some species have more of an impact on their environment than others. And we can look at dominant species. These are the most abundant species in an ecosystem. They have the highest amount of biomass. They have the largest influence on other species. So for example, if you go into a forest, there's usually a lot of large trees that dominate the forest. Because they determine shade and use up nutrients, receiving a lot of the light, etc., they're considered a dominant species. A keystone species is different. This is not abundant in an ecosystem, but they're very important because they play important ecological roles in the community. For example, sea otters feed on sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp. So all of them are affected by a relatively small number of sea otters. If a species dramatically alters their environment, they are called ecosystem engineers. For example, a beaver building a dam will alter their environment. If we look at this model from the bottom up, that states that with an increase in vegetation, there will be an increase in herbivores. Or top down, an increase in herbivores will decrease vegetation. If vegetation and herbivores affect each other equally, there will be a change in the biomass. A disturbance is an event that changes a community. Most communities are constantly being altered. This is called the non-equilibrium model. There is also the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that moderate levels of disturbances increase species diversity. Ecological succession is after all the vegetation has been killed, new organisms move in. For example, in primary succession, like with a volcano erupting, the process begins in a lifeless area. No organisms are left after a volcano has erupted and the area has been covered with lava and turned to rock. The area is colonized by a variety of species which are gradually replaced by others, which in turn are gradually re replaced by others. So in this case, you may have prokaryotes move in, then moss, then lichen, and then eventually larger plants and animals. Secondary succession occurs when a disturbance leaves some soil behind, for example, in the case of a fire. Pathogens are disease-causing microorganisms or agents that can also have a Im big impact on a community. Remember that a disease doesn't just affect one organism, it affects the organisms that eat that or the organisms that are eaten by it.